Um, welcome. Um, so we uh, hopefully we're live. We good? Yeah. So uh, um, welcome to this um, uh, talk here. So there's two things. First, there are an undefined number of people joining us live, um, and this will also be uh, recorded and uh, blogged on for the HDR UK uh, colleagues around HDR. So welcome HDR UK uh, virtually. Um, and the second thing is very unfortunately Jean-Pierre uh, Hubo uh, uh, is, is severely ill and couldn't make it from Switzerland, which was um, unfortunate, but he has sent Juan uh, here, um, who is a postdoc in his group, and my understanding from Jean-Pierre, better than him at homomorphic encryption, uh, which <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, so it's a real, really great pleasure um, to have uh, Juan present this. And both for the people on campus here and generally, I, I get very excited about this topic because it is, I think, a, a really new ability that we have for doing secure computation and secure um, uh, privacy insured um, uh, manipulations, which is so important for genomic data and healthcare data. So over to Juan. Okay, so thanks everyone for the introduction. Uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, be here. Uh, I'll try to do my best uh, uh, with uh, the, the work that is mostly the uh, uh, well, the work of uh, that Jean Pierre uh, has been pushing forward uh, in his group at uh, IDPFL in, in Lausanne. Uh, so, this presentation is an overview of the main technological measures that we can apply in order to get uh, privacy conscious data processing and data sharing across different sites, different medical institutions, uh, especially when dealing with uh, uh, medical data, health data in general, and specifically for genomic data. Just to set the stage uh, in the uh, genomic space, uh, you might know uh, George Church, so the father of modern genomic sequencing. And this is one of the slides that he presented uh, somewhere here in campus uh, a few weeks ago. And if you see carefully in the slide, you can see there mentioned the uh, homomorphic encryption and blockchains as technologies that can be enablers for arriving to the zero dollar cost of genomic sequencing this year, right this year. Uh, so it turns out that we are collaborating also with, uh, with George Church uh, in a joint initiative to uh, try to get these uh, technologies like homomorphic encryption and uh, blockchains running for privacy preserving uh, genomic processing and curing to genomic databases. So this is just to uh, set the stage, but what is the motivation to uh, use these technologies and why are they so necessary? The fact is that during the last years we have witnessed a growing concern uh, regarding medical data breaches. And this is the wall of shame from the US Department of Health where all the breaches, all the data breaches that affect more than 500 people have to be declared and have to be published. It, if we see at the, so this, uh, we have not updated this list, uh, but uh, if you carefully here, there are about around five breaches declared per week. Uh, this means that the number of people that is affected by breaches in the health sector is huge. And there's a huge concern because the medical data and health data is the most uh, invasive data that we can find, the most uh, identifying and personal data uh, that we can find. Uh, at the same time, a second uh, threat that we have witnessed during the last years are uh, ransomware attacks trying to get hold of um, medical data at the hospitals and uh, avoiding this data can be used uh, for their uh, right purposes. And this has affected hospitals all across the world, in the US, in Europe, and uh, also in other places. The third concern and the third threat uh, affects especially uh, genomic data and genomic data sets. And this has also had some impact in the media in, in recent times, but uh, the fact is that a number of uh, works have shown that it is uh, impossible to fully anonymize, to fully de-identify genomic data. Genomic data can be uh, used to re-identify a person, to get uh, infer the membership of, of a person in a cohort uh, with just a few number of uh, mutations, a few number of variants. And this has been shown in several, in multiple works during the last 10 and 15 years. So what happens if genomic data is leaked? So the problem with genomic data is that it is 
inherently identifying, so genomics really fully identify an individual, they can't be changed as opposed to passwords. So they play the same role as biometric information, but with a hard link to the identity of the, of the holder. They have unique statistical regularities, they contain sensitive and personal information, also the predisposition, the propensity to develop certain conditions, certain genetic diseases, and their leakage can expose individuals to genetic discrimination. Imagine if this genetic information can arrive to the insurance company that can decide to discriminate people depending on their predisposition to develop some disease in the following years. And it, don't, it, don't, it doesn't affect only uh, the individual itself, but the individual himself, but also the relatives. So all the ancestry and all the descendants uh, are also related through uh, the genomic information. So disclosing the, the genomic information of an individual also affects all his descendants and ancestry. So this, is, uh, so this presents a major challenge for uh, getting the protection of uh, so how to protect uh, this data. And this is increased uh, by the fact that the required of duration of this protection has to be centuries. This means that the effect of the leakage of genomic data affects the uh, descendants of the uh, individual for several generations. The current data size of genomic data is huge, so we have to protect a large scale uh, and large volumes of, uh, of data. They also need sometimes to carry computation on millions of patient records in order to get uh, statistically significant results due to the uh, individuality on the, and the uh, uh, specificity of the information that is in the uh, genome. They are sometimes noisy due to uh, mutations, due to the uh, noisy sequencing process, and also due to the transfer and storage of these large volumes of data, you can also get some transfer errors there. And they present correlations, not only within the single genome, uh, which is called the linkage disequilibrium between different variants and different genes, but also across genomes due to the kinship at, and, and uh, ethnic ethnicity uh, relations. We have to uh, account for different uh, semi-trusted semi stakeholders in the chain of custody of, uh, and, and the use of um, genomic sequences. Uh, going from the sequencing facilities, including di direct to consuming companies like uh, 23andMe and similars, hospitals, genetic analysis labs, private doctors, and so on, and a plethora of different applications, and that's different requirements ranging from healthcare, medical research, forensics, ancestry, and uh, many more. The uh, issue about uh, the perception of uh, privacy and security in genomes and, and genomic uh, research in general is that you might have heard probably that uh, genomic privacy is hopeless. So why should I care of protecting my digital genomic sequence if anybody can just take uh, a piece of my uh, hair, skin, droplets of saliva, and take all my DNA and, and get hold of my DNA? So why we should care of, about protecting the, the digital version of those DNA, of those uh, DNA data? Uh, and the thing is, what is wrong with this uh, reasoning is that collecting these human biological samples and sequencing them is expensive, illegal, prone to mistakes, and it's completely non-scalable. So no attacker will think of taking this kind of attack to scale and try to sequence uh, a large scale of, of uh, people just getting hold of their droplets of saliva or their, uh, yeah, some biological samples of um, randomly collected from, from people. And the second uh, main issue of this argument is that the medical community should not be the accomplice of massive leaks of sensitive data. So the fact that it might, that an, an attack can happen by getting hold of biological samples out of the hospital doesn't mean that hospitals shouldn't correctly protect and apply technological means in order to uh, avoid that any other leakage can happen through their services and through their facilities. So taking all this into account in this landscape, the privacy and security requirements for personalized health uh, boil down to uh, these six bullet points. So we have to apply a pragmatic approach with a gradual introduction of new protection tools. We have to take into account different sensitivity levels of data, ranging from um, clinical data in the EHR to the very uh, identifiable uh, genomic data, different access rights for all the different stakeholders that can have access to this data, exploit existing data and electronic health records and tools that are already used without disrupting the way they are used in the uh, current healthcare and uh, research environments. 
be future-proof to avoid changing the mechanics and the way uh, that uh, protection measures are applied over time, taking into account also that we need long-term protection, especially for genomic data, and uh, especially taking into account the awareness and enforcement of patient consent. So with all this uh, landscape, which technologies can we use in order to protect uh, genomic data and health data in general? There are different uh, technological measures, uh, most of them rooted in cryptography, that can be used uh, in order to uh, conceal and protect genomic, genomic data at, and, and health data at different stages, uh, from when they are addressed and stored in some facility, when they are transferred between different actors, and when they are computed on for uh, getting some result or doing some analysis uh, on those data. So the first one is traditional encryption. Traditional encryption is the one that is currently used, for example, for bank transactions, for protecting the communication channels, uh, when you connect to uh, uh, the, the web of your bank, uh, when you use a, a mobile app to connect to your uh, insurance company or any other uh, company you, you care about uh, um, uh, sensitivity of the data that you're interchanging. And it can protect data at rest and in transit, but it cannot protect the data while it is being computed on. This means that if we need to compute on the data, we need to first decrypt, so take away all the encryption, and then uh, do the computation on the clear text data. So whomever does the computation gets access to the data. So in order to solve that and protect data also during computation, we can apply uh, three different approaches. Either go for uh, software-based approaches like homomorphic encryption, that is the most promising one, the one uh, in which uh, I will spend a bit more time uh, in the upcoming slides, that can protect computation in untrusted environments, but it also has some uh, limitations regarding versatility and efficiency. We will see how we play with this. Secure multiparty computation that can, uh, it's uh, basically interactive protocols uh, between different stakeholders, different parties holding different uh, inputs that protects the computation in these distributed environments but uh, with uh, communication overhead, so requiring this communication between the different parties. And finally, we have also hardware-based approaches like uh, trusted execution environments, uh, out of which the most uh, widespread one, the most known one, is the Intel SEX, the Secure Guard Extensions. They protect computation uh, by running everything in a secure enclave. There is a tamper-proof element inside the uh, hardware processor. Uh, that nobody can access to. The memory is also encrypted. Uh, it has some limitations regarding the memory size and the size of the programs that can be run uh, on these secure enclaves, uh, but in general it's um, quite more efficient than the software-based approaches, but it also has some drawbacks uh, as it requires trust in the manufacturer. In the case of Intel GX, it's Intel that has to certify all the uh, software that will run on these enclaves, and it is also vulnerable some, to some side channel attacks. So the design of the uh, secure enclaves must be uh, taken care of very carefully. Uh, if we want to protect also data release, uh, we have approaches like uh, differential privacy. So once that we have performed a computation on the data and we want to release the results uh, on, of this computation, uh, these results can also be used in order to uh, relink them back uh, to the users that belong to the cohort that originated this, um, that was used to, to perform this computation. Uh, this means that, for example, we can uh, infer that um, a given uh, individual has taken, play, has taken uh, part uh, of a cohort for an HIV study or a cancer study. And only the fact that of uh, discovering that he has been a member of that cohort discloses his medical condition. So this is also sensitive information. So in order to protect against those disclosures, we can apply differential privacy. And what this, the way this is usually applied is by uh, adding some noise and some randomization to the results uh, so that you degrade slightly the accuracy and the utility of those results, but you increase the privacy and limit the likelihood of one of these membership uh, inference attacks to be successful. So you have to play with this trade-off between privacy and utility. And finally, if we refer to uh, accountability and raw security, integrity of the data, uh, and of course, if we are in a distributed environment with uh, different parties that mutually don't trust each other, uh, then we can resort to uh, the infamous nowadays uh, blockchains or distributed layer technologies uh, that provide a strong accountability and traceability in these distributed environments uh, by running this consistent database that is replicated in all the sites and, uh, uh, and uh, jointly uh, checked and uh, uh, assessed by all the parties individually and uh, collectively. 
but the problem with using these uh, distributed ledger technologies is that they are all about transparency. So whatever is uh, uploaded to a blockchain is visible to all the uh, nodes running the blockchain. So this means that uh, we need to uh, keep at the same time some protection on the data that is uploaded to the blockchain, and for that we can resort to homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, uh, trust execution environments again, uh, so that we can pair that and get the best, the best of both worlds. So I'll go in detail about uh, the traditional encryption, homomorphic encryption, and a bit of multi-party computation, and I give a few notes about uh, blockchains uh, by the end. So the uh, way in which uh, cryptography is usually used uh, to protect uh, data is either to protect confidentiality or through encryption. So we encrypt data so that nobody that doesn't have access to the key that can decrypt those data can uh, uh, get hold on the clear text versions of those data and integrity and non-repudiation so we want to protect the um, any uh, unwanted changes or modifications on the data and, and for that we can use hashes and cryptographic signatures these can protect data at rest so while it is stored so that nobody that gets uh, access to the database uh, can decrypt the data that is stored there or in transit while it is communicated between different parties so we secure this communication channel through uh, encryption. This encryption can come in two different modalities. Uh, so either we uh, use symmetric encryption and this means that uh, encryption and decryption use the same key which is called a secret key. Uh, so again this can be used in transit if both parties have the secret key so this one uses the secret key for encrypting. It is transmitted here. No withdrawer can get hold of the can can get uh, hold of the data, and decrypted here with the same secret key. Or at rest, just by encrypting anything, everything with the same secret key, and only the holder of the secret key can get the data and retrieve it uh, in decrypted form. The problem of this is that uh, we need to uh, do this key exchange and distribute this key somehow to all the stakeholders that should have access to either encryption or decryption uh, of the data. So in order to solve this uh, key distribution problem, we can resort to asymmetric encryption. And it is asymmetric in the sense that the keys needed for encryption and decryption are different. So we have a public key that anybody can use for encrypting and a secret key that only the uh, individual, only the actor that is entitled to decrypt the data has. And so only this one can run the decryption function. So again, this can be used in transit by encrypting with the public key of the destination or at rest, encrypting with the public key of the destination and storing it in the uh, appropriate uh, database. So going to the use case and how do you use the, these uh, encryption mechanisms in the real world? So let's go for the uh, health case. And let's put, it, let's put us in the uh, scenario where we have a multi-site study with different uh, data providers that have a partitioned data set across all of them uh, with either different patients in each of the uh, data sets, so uh, horizontally partitioned, or uh, different uh, uh, variants or different uh, facts uh, about the patient, different observations uh, of the same patient split across different departments or different institutions. What can we do if we want to uh, process this data jointly? And uh, run a multi-site study on this partitioned uh, data set. We can either keep them at each of the sites, so keep them close to the data providers. This is especially useful if we don't have any trusted third party that can hold and host uh, this data, like a cloud, for example. So if we assume that the cloud is untrusted, we cannot move the data to the cloud, and especially if this comes from different uh, parties uh, and they don't agree in putting them in one sole cloud, so they don't trust the same cloud, then this is not uh, possible. We have to keep them at each side, and we have better control on the data. Or if everybody agrees on which is the data, uh, the data holder and the, the data processor that, with, uh, that will uh, get this data and process it, uh, then we can move everything to the cloud and take advantage of the well-known strengths of the cloud. And these strengths are uh, that the cloud accepts uh, multiple different tenants, uh, different and usually unrelated legal, ent legal entities that store their, their data in this infrastructure that is usually managed by another different third party, third legal entity. With uh, mutualization of storage and computation capabilities, IT manpower, uh, no up from investment from the customer, and uh, it's usually professionally managed, thus more secure than the locally uh, than the local facilities that are uh, locally managed uh, by uh, typically 
uh, a reduced set of staff compared to the staff that is ma uh, managing uh, cloud security. And the problem with this approach and moving data to the cloud is how we deal with privacy in the cloud and whether the cloud is trustworthy to all the data providers sending the data to this uh, central uh, data holder. And if it is not trusted, then we have to resort to encryption solutions. Legally, so from the legal domain, uh, well, I, I'm not a legal expert, but um, there are uh, several regulations that um, try to give some guidelines on how to uh, address uh, this problem of data sharing and uh, moving data, outsourcing data uh, to a third party. And one of them um, affects, for example, the transfer of data between US and EU and uh, safe harbor and it has been translated lately into the data shield that uh, basically pushes to keep the data closest to the source and take the computation to the data instead of taking the, the data to the computation. And we also have the US Cloud Act and some other uh, legislation, uh, legislations uh, across the globe. Uh, the fact is that the main global providers, uh, that are these three, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft Azure, uh, they all three have more or less the same uh, terms of use and same uh, uh, service level agreements that have to be signed whenever data is moved uh, to the cloud. And these cloud services are offered at different levels uh, from the infrastructure, giving raw access to the, uh, to the machine and uh, um, basically working on the at the hardware level on the machine, a platform as a service, giving access to the operating system and producing the application that will run on top of uh, this operating system, or software as a service that is more targeted to the final end users, giving direct access to an application that is running on a virtual machine in uh, one of these cloud uh, systems. So going back to this encryption, how can we protect the data that we send to one of these uh, software as a service? Um, a, applications. Uh, if we send, if we fully trust the cloud, we can just send all the data to the cloud and keep them in the clear. This is not never done. So this is uh, an approach that is never uh, used. But this would be the, the straightforward approach to enable both data sharing and computation because everything is easy because everything is in the clear. But for that, you need to fully trust the cloud. And in any case, even if you fully trust the cloud, this will never happen because the cloud will keep the data in encrypted form. But they will do the key management. So they will have all the keys needed to encrypt or decrypt this data. And this means that the user has no control on the access policies and the, uh, uh, who has uh, access or who can execute determined uh, functions or operations on the data that is uploaded to the cloud. Again, data sharing is easy, computation in the cloud is easy because everything is taken care of by the cloud. If we want to retain the control of the data and give this control to the users and to the data, data owners, we have to also move the key management to the users and give the keys to the users. In this case, if the user is the only one that, hosts, that uh, holds the keys, he encrypts the, the data with his own key, sends data to the cloud. The cloud cannot do anything without that encryption key. This means that data sharing is tricky because of key management and data coming from different uh, stakeholders, different users with different keys. And the computation in the cloud is impossible because the cloud cannot decrypt, so it cannot compute on the data. So this is where homomorphic encryption comes to the rescue. So instead of using traditional encryption that doesn't enable any kind of computation on the encrypted data, what we can do is apply this homomorphic encryption that what it enables is to follow any of these two paths indistinctly. The usual path that we will follow in a fully trusted scenario is we take those two, uh, these two inputs, we want to compute a function, there is this circle function on these two inputs, we compute A circle B, and then we can encrypt the result to store it elsewhere. Homomorphic encryption enables to just encrypt all the inputs and perform an equivalent function, that is in this case this asterisk function, that takes two encryptions and uh, let's say that it uh, composes them together. And the result is the same as if we computed on the clear text uh, inputs and afterwards encrypted them. This means that all this computation can be done in a blind way. And a user can just encrypt all the inputs under the same key send these encrypted inputs, encryption of a three, encryption of a five to the cloud. The cloud runs, for example, three plus five, and instead of knowing what is in here or what is in here, it just runs the encryption of three plus encryption of five and gets, by the end of the day, the encryption of eight by the black magic that happens behind the curtains. So this enables some of the computations that can be done on the data in encrypted form so that the cloud is completely agnostic, oblivious on the clear text data that is exported, outsourced to this cloud, and data sharing is enabled again. 
So the, term, the terminology here uh, for uh, homomorphic encryption and uh, cryptographic systems in general, we go from a plain text space to a ciphertext space, and between these two spaces, we establish this homomorphism that determines that whatever happens in this uh, plain text space under this uh, square function can be done equally well in the ciphertext space with this uh, cross uh, function the same way. So again, uh, this can be generalized to a given functionality, not necessarily just one operation on two data, uh, on two uh, pieces of data. Uh, so we get encryption of all the input data. Uh, so we encrypt this data. We execute this evaluation that is enabled by the homomorphism, and then we can decrypt the result. And again, this enables uh, sending all the data to the cloud, storing the data in encrypted form, evaluating here blindly, and getting the result by the appropriate destination of the of the uh, that result. So. Uh, I can give you more uh, technical details, uh, but for the sake of uh, time and uh, for not boring you with all the mathematical uh, stuff, uh, I will skip those details and go basically to the practical stuff. Uh, that is how this plays into the real world and what's the current status on homomorphic encryption. So what can be done and who is pushing for using homomorphic encryption in the real world? It, for this, um, I think it's enough to uh, say that um, during the last two years, um, given the progress that has and that have happened uh, during the last uh, ten years uh, since uh, Gentry's breakthrough in 2009 about fully homomorphic encryption, uh, during these last two years, um, a standardization group for homomorphic encryption was established. Uh, this is a, a joint consortium uh, uh, that is formed by industry um, partners like crypto experts, Duality Technologies, Galois and very big partners uh, like IBM, Intel, Microsoft, SAP, together with academia, um, including uh, MIT, uh, New Jersey, uh, San Diego, uh, Seoul National University, EPFL in Lausanne, and government institutions in the US like NIH, uh, NIST, NSF is power, uh, to try to uh, get some rules and specifications on how homomorphic encryption should be used and which are the right ways of parameterizing and employing uh, homomorphic encryption in practical use cases. And uh, one of the main outcomes of these gatherings, uh, the next one of which will happen in August uh, this year in Santa Clara in the US, uh, is this document uh, on uh, the security standard for homomorphic encryption. Uh, the slides will be shared after the, the, um, uh, the presentation, so you will have all, this, all the links and uh, all the information available for you to consult afterwards. And uh, in practice and um, uh, in the real world, there are also some open source homomorphic encryption libraries backed by uh, some of these big industry players like Microsoft, IBM, Duality, uh, and Cryptolabs, uh, and also some, uh, and Infer also. Uh, and some other uh, libraries backed by universities like uh, uh, this uh, CUDA enabled homomorphic library, homomorphic encryption, uh, NFL or Latigo that we are also uh, putting forward at EPFL. So as you can see, the status is mm, pretty advanced right now in trying to push in this to a technology readiness level that can make it available for the, uh, for the market. And it is about to get to the stage where it is fully practical and fully usable in outsourced and distributed scenarios. So the second uh, approach that we can use uh, in, um, uh, as a cryptographic uh, way of protecting data in uh, multi-site studies is multi-party computation. So multi-party computation, secure multi-party computation, is uh, basically defined across a uh, plurality of uh, different parties that each of them has uh, its own inputs. So this can be uh, different databases uh, split uh, across all these five um, users, all these five uh, parties. It can be uh, medical institutions or uh, data silos. And all of them want to compute a determined function that can be an analysis or a, a regression, for example, or uh, some computation on all these inputs. So in order to enable that in a way that we preserve the privacy requirements so that no party should learn anything more than, is, than uh, what, the, what it's prescribed to receive as the output and the correctness that each party is guaranteed to receive the correct, and the, uh, to the correct output from the execution of this function as if it was executed in just one central place. Uh, then we can run this multi-party protocol. What it, what it does is 
running some interaction and sending some random nonsense, random values uh, among all these parties. And by the end of the day, again, that this black magic and this uh, cryptography that happens under the curtains, we get that each of the parties receives uh, the output without disclosing the inputs of the other parties. Uh, the problem with, uh, with these protocols is how they can be defined and how we can determine that they are secure. And because secure is one of the main terms and the main adjectives that are used in secure multiparty computation. So how can we trust these protocols to not leak anything else than what we want them to, to disclose by the end of the day? So for this, we need a clear definition of what security means and what is uh, a secure protocol here. And for that, uh, we need a definition of the network model, the definition of the adversarial model, and the definition of the expected security guarantees that we want to preserve during the computation. So without these components, it's impossible to reason about the security of a protocol. And well, I can go more in depth about how these are defined. Uh, I will um, uh, just go quickly on these slides because uh, you will have all the information afterwards. Regarding the network model, it depends on the abstraction of the network, how the messages are delivered, the channel security, the topology of the network, uh, the access to helper functionalities like the authentication infrastructure, uh, common reference and string, a broadcast channel, and Regarding the adversarial model, uh, this is always from the standpoint of a honest user. If there, are, if there are no honest users in the network, then security is hopeless because it makes no sense to design security protocol if nobody is honest, of course. Uh, so from the standpoint of a honest user, uh, all the rest of the users are adversaries. So how we categorize these adversaries is depending on how many parties can be corrupted, so which is the threshold of parties that can be corrupted, uh, how are they behaving, whether they are passive, so they don't breach the protocols, they don't try to break the protocol, but they try to peer into the data that they receive to try to get some further information or to infer some extra data on those um, uh, traces. They can be active, they can actively break the protocol, or they can be covered. So they can only break the protocol if they know that they will not be caught. Uh, regarding the complexity, they can be polynomial time, quantum adversary, again, that has access to the quantum computers that theoretically they can break any of the currently available public key cryptography uh, and or computationally embodied, uh, in which case we will uh, define information theoretic uh, a model for secure computation. And regarding the corruption strategy, we can have static corruption, adaptive corruption, or proactive defense. Uh, regarding the security guarantees, we can apply privacy, correctness, uh, the independence of inputs so that the uh, corrupted parties don't have any kind of influence on the inputs for the honest parties. Uh, guaranteed output delivery, so that it is correctly delivered to both uh, honest and malicious parties and fairness that corrupted parties should not receive their outputs if the uh, honest parties are not receiving uh, their corresponding outputs. However, uh, of course, this definition of security guarantees is not comprehensive and it might not be exhaustive enough for a determined use case. So in order to uh, overcome that limitation, we cannot play the cat and mouse game and try to define uh, each of the security properties that we want to preserve. Uh, what we do usually when we are analyzing this kind of secure multi-party computation protocols is using an analogy and make that this computation in the real world where we have real players that are imperfect and can become corrupted, and simulate it with a fully trusted central authority that is completely trusted by all the actors in the network so that all of them can just send their inputs uh, blindly to, the, to this guy that will run the whole computation, not try to extract any kind of information from the outputs of the computation and deliver the correct results to all the players. If this real protocol can perfectly emulate the situation and the outcomes that can be extracted from this ideal protocol, then we can fairly say that this real protocol is secure. And this is the, the, the typical analysis, the typical security analysis, and the way of analyzing security in secure multiparty computation. Uh, yeah. Again, uh, I will go uh, quickly on this. Uh, we can find examples of uh, incorrect uh, definitions of uh, privacy and how a protocol that is that has not been designed with the, uh, this ideal paradigm in mind, uh, we can find a lot of flaws and uh, discover a lot of um, uh, collusion between the players that can happen in order to extract and leak some extra data and so on. Again, I will not go into details for, for this. Uh, and then going practical. So how practical is secure multipathic computation in the real world? Uh, 
Nowadays, uh, well, multi the history of secure multipartite computation is uh, much uh, older uh, than uh, homomorphic encryption. So there have been uh, multipartite computation protocols for more than uh, 40, 50 years ago. So they started in 1982, the uh, first time. And uh, nowadays, there exist operational tools that can directly uh, compile the description of a protocol to the execution of a multiparty computation uh, interaction in a secure way between different parties. So it's relatively easy uh, to get a, an abstract description of a, of a protocol <coughs> logic compiled to uh, this kind of uh, secure multiparty computation uh, protocols. The computational overhead here and the communication, especially, can be an issue. Uh, and Mm, to make it a bit more confusing, uh, secure multiparty computation can also be implemented with homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption by the end of the day is just one more block that you can use in order to enable a blind computation on uh, data that you don't want to disclose. So this can enable some of the functionalities that can lead to a secure multiparty uh, protocol uh, that is correct and secure. And some companies active in this field are, for example, Cybernetica uh, in Estonia, uh, have this ShareMind project, uh, Diaric that has some uh, software for key management, Infer, they are based in Switzerland, uh, also DPFL campus, uh, incidentally, uh, that they have some uh, products for secure multiparty computation, but also a library for fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, and of course, the, the big player here is Microsoft Research and other players like uh, Nebula Genomics and so on. So again, this is becoming practical, it's becoming increasingly used, uh, and it's also being marketed as a commercial solution that can be applied in order to protect privacy in uh, practical uh, scenarios. Uh, going to the case of uh, Switzerland and to the specific uh, health domain, the approach that we are taking in Switzerland is uh, a multidisciplinary approach where we are taking into account not only the technical aspects of uh, privacy protection, but also the uh, domain uh, information and domain expert information about the uh, genomics and health um, a, a field and the uh, ethics and policy. So taking into account both the legal and ethical issues that can affect, and by the end of the day, they are the ones determining which are the privacy levels and the security levels that have to be achieved on data that is shared or outsourced. Uh, so this uh, project that is called Data Protection and Personalized Health is a project that has started one year ago, so we're, we are just uh, right now in uh, uh, one year after the start of the project. It will run for two more years uh, across the whole uh, Switzerland, and it joins together experts from all these different fields, from uh, privacy conscious data processing, of which uh, Jean-Pierre Hubot is the, uh, one of the uh, world-renowned experts uh, in this field. A distributed and decentralized trust and blockchain uh, technologies, fundamental cryptography and mathematical aspects of uh, cryptographic protection, the application domain uh, knowledge and the genomic application, uh, Jacques Fillet, uh, the big data provenance, uh, reproducible research um, a factor also from the Swiss Data Science Center led by Olivier Frecher, and the uh, health and ethics, uh, health ethics and, and policy, led by uh, the group at uh, Zurich, by, led by Effi Bayena. The targets of this uh, project are to address the main privacy, security, scalability, and ethical challenges of data sharing for, for enabling effective personalized uh, precision medicine, especially uh, when dealing with genomic data. And for that, we are defining an optimal balance between usability, scalability, and data protection by making use of the tools like homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, we've seen in the previous slides, uh, and uh, delivering a set of computing tools that can be used in practical uh, scenarios. And the envisioned deployment here, uh, well, Switzerland is a geographically uh, constrained uh, field. It's, it's a relatively small country. If we compare it, for example, with uh, the scale of the European Union or the US, but the good thing about Switzerland is that it's a highly federal. Uh, it has a highly federal structure. Uh, this means that the, the use cases that we can run here and the, the, the scenarios that we can run here in Switzerland uh, can be extrapolated to uh, international uh, data sharing and uh, sharing data across multiple different uh, uh, regulatory frameworks and uh, different geographic barriers. Uh, and here in, uh, well, there in Switzerland, we have uh, five different university hospitals spread across the uh, uh, the Swiss geography that each of them uh, wants to hold their data and compute globally and collectively on the data that uh, is hosted and is collected from each of these uh, university hospitals independently and individually in order to increase the accuracy and the uh, precision of the results that, ca that can be obtained from these uh, studies. So 
for this, we have uh, two phases that are the typical two, two phases in, uh, in the clinical research. A discovery phase uh, that is focused on uh, determining how many patients uh, are available in the whole network that match a determined criteria that determine the feasibility of a study. And for that, uh, we have already produced a, a prototype that makes use of both homomorphy encryption, multi-party computation, and collective distribution of trust that we call MEDCO, and that uh, runs or tries to combine the best of the biomed and the security uh, worlds by taking a data model from uh, the most widespread uh, cohort respiration tool that is called I2B2, an interrelated meta layer that is called Picture, uh, again, you will find all the links uh, to all these uh, elements uh, in the slides uh, that will be uh, delivered to you after the presentation. A, a modern graphical user interface called uh, Glowing Bear that is developed by a, um, this uh, a Dutch company called Hive. And the main cryptographic core that we have produced at EPFL that we call Unlinx, that is a privacy-preserving computing framework in order, in order to enable privacy-conscious data sharing and, uh, and data processing. All this uh, enables feasibility analysis, feasibility studies on distributed cohorts of data. And the way it works is by uh, using homomorphic encryption and uh, splitting the keys from the different sites. So here, for example, we have four different data providers, each of them with their own pair of uh, private public key. And uh, we basically combine all those keys and generate a collective key, collective key that is the only key that is used to encrypt any piece of data that goes into the network. Uh, this means that uh, as this key is collectively generated, nobody has the secret key corresponding to this public key, and nobody can decrypt anything that is encrypted under this key. In order to do any kind, any kind of operation or decryption on this data, we need the agreement of all the parties of all the um, uh, nodes in the network in order to produce and uh, enable that decryption. Uh, so the way that the system works, and you will see that in a, in a brief uh, video demo in the, in the next slide, uh, is an investigator generates a query, encrypts all the query terms uh, with this collective key, sends these encrypted query terms to the network, the network runs this secure multi-party computation protocol, uh, determines which are the matches, which are the matching patients in the network, adds up uh, all those numbers of, of patients using homomorphic encryption with um, this uh, collective aggregation protocol. And uh, finally, the final result that is still encrypted under homomorphic encryption is re-encrypted through another uh, collective protocol and sent back to the investigator encrypted under his own key so that only the investigator can decrypt the final result. We can also add to the mix differential privacy so that we can uh, protect the result from membership inference attacks uh, or reconstruction attacks and, and so on. So the way it works is, uh, is this. Uh, so this is the main uh, interface. Uh, this is the authentication uh, interface of the user. So the user puts the login password, authenticates against the key clock backend. Uh, and this is the main glowing bear uh, interface that we have slightly modified to run all the, all the cryptographic functions uh, under the curtain. So all the encryption, decryption, key management, everything is completely transparent to the user. Uh, here on the left, uh, we have an ontology of different terms. Uh, both clinical and genomic terms that can be used in order to uh, build um, these queries that are uh, basically logical Boolean queries with and or uh, joining and or criteria. For example, patients that have a melanoma that have a mutation in uh, the uh, BRAF uh, gene and uh, in the protein position uh, 600 uh, with any sagacity for the, the variant in this gene. So just by drag and dropping these elements here, we're defining this query made of these three elements that are related to buying and uh, function. So once that this is uh, finalized and defined, the user just runs the update. Behind the curtains, the, the uh, cryptographic mechanisms here encrypt all these query terms, send them encrypted to the servers. Uh, in this case, for this example, we have three different servers running at different um, uh, sites. They run these multi-party protocols, do the collective aggregation with homomorphic encryption, and obtain the result that is sent back to the client. So we have here the result that can be shown and split, uh, showing the, the individual aggregation for each of the hospitals. It can be uh, split. Um, it can be also uh, fully randomized, so that it's not possible to link which result belongs to each of the hospital. It can be fully aggregated across the whole network. We can add differential privacy and so on. But the, 
good. The, the, the best thing about this is that it is fully transparent. So the user experience is exactly the same as uh, a, when using the system with no protection at all. And in order to give you some hint about which is the performance uh, of this, uh, all this encrypted machinery in place, you can see here in this uh, figure on the right, uh, for this same query that we have seen in the, in the example, and with a mid-size uh, database uh, ranging from 1,000 to 8,000 uh, users uh, with more than 1 million clinical and genetic attributes from, taken from uh, a publicly available data from the Cancer Genome Atlas, from this GA. Uh, the performance and the response time from the uh, clear attack system, uh, clear attack system is this green uh, bars, so seven, nine, ten, 12 seconds. And the performance of the encrypted system is this blue uh, bars that you can see that the difference in performance, so the, uh, the difference with respect to the uh, system with no protection at all is basically negligible. And this is with all the encrypted machinery in place, doing all the uh, homomorphic encryption, all the multipathic computation protocols across all the nodes, and running the homomorphic encryption, uh, homomorphic uh, enabled addition uh, to get the number of uh, matching patients. Uh, so with a clever combination of all these different protection techniques, we can arrive at this kind of performance uh, for some applications. So this covers the first phase, the, the, the feasibility analysis, so cohort discovery and cohort exploration. For the second phase, uh, we can go for uh, uh, running the analysis on the identified cohort. So this becomes a bit more complex. Uh, for this, we need a fully decentralized architecture because the data should remain uh, at each of the sites. Uh, the data, um, uh, yeah, it's a fully centralized architecture. The res we need resistance against uh, collusion and against malicious adversaries uh, that can be part of the network. And right now, at the moment, we can execute uh, simple machine learning uh, functions like linear regression, logistic regression. Those are um, perfectly computable under homomorphic encryption multiparty computation. And we are currently working on extending these operations to more complex uh, workflows, especially going to neural networks and uh, more complex machine learning uh, analysis. And you will know more about us in the, in the upcoming months about the results on this, uh, on this path. And there's one uh, famous word, the, the B word. So the, what does the blockchain do in all this picture and how blockchains, uh, what's the role of blockchain in, in, in this picture? So again, within the, the Swiss personalized health network and within the framework of this data protection and personalized health uh, project, uh, the idea of uh, and the role of the blockchain there uh, is to get to um, enable provenance and reproducibility and full traceability of everything that happens in the system across the network, uh, guaranteeing a fully consistent state across all the elements in the network. And this is feasible and blockchains here are applicable uh, due to the fact that uh, all these uh, different nodes are mutually non-trusted uh, nodes that need to cooperate to get the results of an analysis. So here blockchains make sense. In the last two, three years, we have seen a lot of nonsensical uh, applications of blockchains, uh, but uh, now the hype is still uh, slowly coming down and, and coming back to reality, and which is the actual benefit that we can get from blockchains. This is one of the cases where blockchains really make sense. Uh, and with that, we get uh, this immutable lock, uh, provenance and reproducibility and full traceability of whatever happened in the system. And we can also manage access control and identities in a federated and fully decentralized way by storing all these access uh, patterns and, and um, access policies in this uh, blockchain, uh, in these blockchain blocks. Uh, I have talked a lot, a lot about uh, Switzerland, uh, but of course uh, in our group, and this is one of the, the main efforts and the main targets of uh, Jean-Pierre, is uh, being international and not just uh, focusing ourselves only in the, the application of our techniques and our approaches in Switzerland. And that's the main reason and uh, that we have tried to uh, collaborate uh, from uh, some years now with the Global Alliance of, of Genomics and Health and uh, uh, thankfully to the, this collaboration, uh, we have uh, managed to uh, also try to contribute uh, to this uh, global effort of the Global Alliance of Genomics and Health and be part of uh, one of the main foundational uh, work streams that is the security, um, data security work stream uh, that is in charge of analyzing and assessing uh, the security of all the standards that come out of the uh, Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. 
Uh, just to, uh, if, uh, well, I assume that all of you in the room know what uh, the G4GH is, but uh, maybe some of the, the remote attendees don't know. So, uh, just two slides uh, about what's the organization uh, of the G4GH and how uh, it works. Uh, so the G4GH uh, intends to produce standards, guidelines, and recommendations on uh, systems working on genomic and health data. Uh, for this, it is structured uh, as this matrix. We have all the uh, work streams uh, on the left as horizontal, uh, uh, horizontal elements. Uh, these are uh, internal to the G4GH, and they uh, basically deliver and produce uh, all these standards uh, for different uh, fields like discovery, large-scale genomics, uh, data use on researcher identity management, cloud uh, genomic knowledge standards, clinical and, pheno and uh, phenotypic data capture. And uh, on the other hand, we have the real-world data projects that are external to the uh, G4GH and provide the requirements and the use cases where all these standards should be applied so that you have this connection with the real world and all these standards that the G4GH produces are really bound to a real use case and really usable and useful in practice. Uh, in parallel with all these technical work streams, we have two uh, foundational work streams in charge of the regulatory ethics and the data security. Uh, these two uh, uh, work streams basically oversee uh, the standards that are produced by the technical work streams in terms of uh, the relation with the regulation and the ethical frameworks and the relation to data security standards and privacy and security guarantees. Uh, so. In terms of data security, uh, besides this um, uh, overseeing security for the standards, uh, the data security is also working on a specific uh, product, specific blocks uh, that can be used uh, and applied in practical use cases. Uh, and in particular, we have two uh, standards that we are ri uh, right now uh, developing that are the authentication and authorization infrastructure. That is a technical profile for authenticating the identity of individuals seeking to access data and services in federated networks. And the breach notification and response protocol that uh, intends to effectively to provide guidelines and procedures to effectively respond and recover, uh, and recover uh, from security breaches. And we are uh, also uh, having some very active and uh, lively discussions with the cloud work stream in terms of uh, what's the level of security that has to be guaranteed uh, in cloud at source the scenarios and how we can apply uh, homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation and all these forefront uh, technological measures uh, in practical use cases. Uh, just to uh, wrap up on uh, the, the information uh, that you can find on the, the main events, uh, events that are happening uh, currently about privacy and security in the genomic field. Uh, the main venue for uh, genome privacy and security is called Genopri. Uh, it has been uh, already held for, uh, it has already survived <laughs> six uh, editions. Uh, the seventh edition will take place uh, in Boston this year, in October, the 21st, 22nd, collocated with the G4DH. As you, have seen, as you can see from here, there's a trend from going together with the computer security uh, community in the Privacy Enhancing Technology Symposium, uh, IEEE Security and Privacy, to the application domain uh, experts like uh, AMIA, uh, the American Society for Human Gen Genetics, and finally with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, uh, with which it has been collocated in the last two years, and it will also be collocated uh, this year in October. Uh, the second... Um, uh, event that I want to highlight is the IDASH challenge. So the IDASH challenge is a computation um, that is organized uh, in an international scale where uh, groups working on security and privacy can submit uh, solutions to uh, challenges in biomedical big data scenarios, uh, applying these advanced cryptographic techniques like homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, blockchain technologies, and trust execution environments and they are tested and evaluated compared with each other and this uh, has helped a lot the field in advancing the, these techniques and tailoring them to specific practical use cases and making them much more efficient and much more practical and versatile uh, and usable in, this, um, in these scenarios. And the participation has been amazing during the last, um, uh, during the whole six years that uh, it has been running. Uh, with uh, winners and runner-ups during the last years uh, belonging both to academia, MIT, Yale, Cornell, uh, San Diego, CNRS in France, INRIA in France, EA, uh, Seoul National University, EPFL in Switzerland, but also from the industrial uh, field. 
uh, and we can highlight here Microsoft Research, Intel, IBM, Duality, Infer, among others. Uh, and finally, we have uh, this community website. Uh, this is called genomeprivacy.org. Uh, this is a website maintained by uh, also our group at EBFL uh, that has all the information about uh, recent publications, uh, groups working on this field, and uh, the recent and future events, tutorials, tools, uh, so all the information that you can um, uh, that you want to get on genome privacy, you can find it there. Uh, finally. Uh, I think that uh, I have not uh, addressed uh, during this talk is the privacy challenge of mHealth. So we are in the era of the Internet of Things, and it's more it's increasingly uh, common that people bring their own devices to to work, uh, use their mobile uh, devices, their connected devices to access their um, a health provider, uh, to access their insurance uh, provider, their banking account, so on and so on. And uh, for this, they need to install an app. The problem is that together with that app, there are many other different apps that people usually also install, like uh, Facebook, Twitter, and, and so on. And all these apps have access to this list of applications that are installed in the mobile. And this means that all this uh, information about the list of applications that the user is installing in his phone can be sent to third-party servers that can do then profiling or uh, maliciously use uh, this data for discriminating, uh, shaming, or profiling the user. And uh, the problem with this is that just having installed an application on diabetes can disclose the medical condition of the uh, user of the phone. So the just the presence of these applications has to be concealed somehow. And for that, uh, one of the uh, prototypes that we have uh, also produced uh, at EPFL uh, is called uh, Hide My App. Uh, again, computer scientists are not the best in, in putting brand names to to, uh, to these kind of prototypes, but it's, uh, this is not bad. Uh, it's called uh, HMA, Hide My App, and what it does is uh, taking all these sensitive applications and hiding them with this Hide My App Manager that is the only one that is disclosed to all the, the rest of the applications uh, installed in the phone. And through these technologies like app virtualization, dynamic loading of classes, and so on, the presence of these applications are running a virtualized container and isolated from all the other applications running in the phone so that it's not possible for them to discover the presence of these uh, health applications. The signature of these applications is all changed so that it is not recognizable or, or uh, re-identifiable. And therefore, all this information cannot be sent to any third party servers or misused anyhow. So uh, just to conclude, uh, the just a few takeaways uh, from uh, all the, the massive amount of information that I've given in just uh, these 60 minutes. Uh, it is important to consider that worldwide, the confidentiality of health data is at jeopardy. So health data has to be protected. Precision medic medicine dramatically increases the amount of data that is uh, available in the wild and, and uh, available for uh, running different analysis and uh, used both for research and healthcare uh, to enable this uh, precision medicine, medicine dream. Uh, advanced cryptographic techniques like homomorphic encryption, multipath computation, trust execution environments can help uh, protecting this data. Mobile device collect, uh, collect more data and more health-related data that also need to be properly secured. So this is another um, a variable that has to be factored in and taken into account. And what is more important is that no system is fully and completely secure. So technology alone cannot fully protect against all the possible threats. So all these technological measures have to be paired with awareness, training, education, and organizational measures about how these techniques are used and how uh, the policies of data usage and data transfer are implemented and used uh, in each of the institutions. And at the Swiss scale, uh, I have shown you this example of the Data Protection in Personalized Health project. There is a response to all these concerns in all these different um, uh, domains from the health, uh, ethics, uh, uh, legal aspects, uh, technological aspects, and uh, domain expertise uh, in genomics in particular, but health in general. And at the international level, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health is strongly committed to data security. Uh, and the testament of that is the presence of this foundational work stream of data security that oversees the security of all the standards uh, uh, coming out of G4GH, uh, guaranteeing that all the products of G4GH uh, conform to uh, the highest levels of security. 
And you can find all, all the links there to the project, the tools, the uh, community website, and the General Pry uh, workshop. And uh, well, that's all from my part. I think I've, I'm a bit over time. Yeah. But well, uh, we started a bit late. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so uh, we do have some time for questions if anybody wants to. I know that we're running a little bit out of time. Oh, oh, wait a second. There's a, please use the microphone so that we can um, get the. Uh, uh. Hello, uh, I'm just. I have just started the my job. I'm an IT security officer of EBI. Uh, actually, I I'm asking. Uh, it, that was a good presentation. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask about how for the, about a practical question. Uh, for example. Uh, there is lots of uh, health data. For example, let me say, forget about Brexit. Let me say I'm a European citizen, and uh, I, I'm giving my uh, health data, my blood to you to uh, for your genome projects, etc. Or you collecting it from the national health system. So one, I have uh, after three years, I come here and according to GDPR, I say I'm giving up my consent, uh, f uh, delete my old data. How do you uh, find the data <laughs> and delete it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, GDPR is becoming a nightmare for some of the implementation uh, of uh, some of these relations, and the right to be forgotten. So, this Article 18 of the, uh, the GDPR uh, is one of the most difficult to to implement. So, the right of erasure, the right to be forgotten. Uh, so whenever a, a user uh, wants to enact uh, this right and remove the data from uh, a database. Uh, if the data is encrypted, then there's no problem. It can be deleted the same way as if it was in the clear text. The thing is, you need to identify and you need to, to know that this data uh, belongs to this user and then remove the, the record in the same way as you would do with a clear text uh, data set. The main conflict uh, in implementing the, this uh, right of erasure comes when blockchains uh, come into play. Uh, when you have blockchains, uh, blockchain is all about immutability and transparency. So everything that is in the blockchain stays in the blockchain forever. So it cannot be deleted. Uh, the, the, um, uh, so how to technically enable uh, data erasure when you store data in the blockchain is a major concern, a very hot topic that is being discussed right now. And actually, I think there's an, uh, an open consultation uh, at the EU level, uh, at the Commission level, uh, on how to technologically implement uh, the, the right to be forgotten, the right of erasure, uh, in this kind of uh, blockchain-based uh, environments or blockchain-based approaches. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, the good approach is to never store genomic data in, the ch in our blockchain. Mm -hmm. So that will never happen. First, because of the sensitivity of the data. Second, uh, because of the scale mm -hmm. of the data. It's completely impossible. So if you have heard of any startup that say, okay, I'm, we are storing the, the genomic data in the chain, that's false for sure. Uh, so uh, taking this into account, if the chain only has the links and the hashes of the data, then data erasure becomes feasible because what you can do is just remove the data source. So where the data is stored, that is not in the chain. So then even if the chain is immutable, you only keep the links. But I mean, the, the, again, there's an open consultation and there's a lot of controversy on how this right to be forgotten, right to pressure is implemented. Uh, for example, even uh, a, a search engine like Google, so how you ask Google to, to remove all your data from the search engine and make you completely uh, impossible to find through the through a search in Google. And just the, the, the way the, the, the engine works makes it impossible to delete all the personal data because you don't know where the data is stored and which of the results that have been computed taking into account those data will be modified if this, if this data is deleted. So deleting this data, deleting it from all the um, impact and the effects uh, and the results produced from this data is impossible. So the, the, again, I'm not a, a legal expert, uh, so I, I cannot put, put my hand here in the, in the fire for, for this, but um, usually the, the law is kind of uh, a relatively fussy and, and uh, open in this way, so it doesn't bind to a technological measure to apply, uh, uh, to be applied to anything and to be enforced, and it gives some room for interpretation to be able to cope with the advance in technology, and uh, again, how we do things, for example, with homomorphic encryption, with blockchains, uh, which are uh, practical uh, responses to these problems from the technology community. Uh, this is not uh, fully enforced or fully determined and specified by the law. 
again, law and technology advance at different paces, uh, but they end up uh, coming together at some point. Okay, have I answered your question? Shil? Um, I can speak louder. No, no, because the, the people on the internet can't hear you. Um, so, so hi, um, I'm Sushil. Um, I'm a recovering mathematician. Um, um, I spent two, or two years of my life doing encryption and, and um, compression algorithms. Um, so this is fully mo uh, homomorphic encryption that you've presented as well. It is somewhat homomorphic encryption. Again, th there's a distinction, yeah. a very clear distinction between what is practical homomorphic encryption and yeah. fully homomorphic encryption. Yeah. So, so okay. what you presented is partially homomorphic encryption. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so so I I completely I'm sold on the framework you presented. Mm -hmm. You know, using secure multi-party computation, using homomorphic encryption, you need blockchain for audit trails. You need all of the. the I think I think what we need from the GA for GH, for example, and these big uh, initiatives is what is the framework to do this? Um, we we just. It's not just homomorphic encryption, it's a suite of tools. It's also regulations, also laws to make sure that we can do all of these things in a secure way. As you mentioned, training as well. I think my question really is, what is our joint approach taking this forward? Um, and there's you know, buzzwords that come and go, as, as you mentioned with the answer in the blockchain. But what is the, our approach? Uh, what is your approach, EPL, EPFL's approach to try and push what is the different things or technologies or recommendations you, you need to give to make, because you use the word a magic happens, you know, black magic happens. Uh, that doesn't give me trust uh, <laughs> into the fact that, you know, uh, this is verified and validated mm -hmm. at scale. So uh, I, again, this is a very long winded question, but I think there is no short answer, but I mean, it, that's a really important uh, point, actually. The approach that we are following, and I think we are, we're discovering this uh, as we run through it, and uh, the approach that we are following is the same as we are following in this uh, data protection in personalized health project, that is bringing together all the experts from the different uh, fields, from the regulatory and ethics, uh, um, uh, the, the security experts, privacy experts, and the domain experts from the biomed uh, field, because each of these fields speaks a different language. So we, we need a common ontology to, to understand each other, just, just for starters. Uh, so just coming together and bringing all these different stakeholders in the same uh, room, talking together about uh, the understanding, the capacity and the potential of the technology, understanding how it can be applied in order to translate the uh, legal uh, recommendations or the, the regulatory frameworks into actual technological enforcement of uh, some of the uh, regulatory frameworks or, or um, uh, uh, articles in law, and how this can enable the research in the biomed field at the same time, this has to be a joint effort. I mean, this is not something that uh, security uh, specialists can do by ourselves because we don't have the domain expertise. We don't have the, the, the legal expertise. So we need to keep all these people together in the same room, make them understand each other, uh, build awareness on these technologies, awareness also from the privacy community on the uh, needs and requirements from the biomed community, and awareness from both communities on the legal frameworks. So th this is the first stage. This is the, f the first step that has to be taken, and I think this is not only our approach, it's also the, the G4GH approach. Yeah. So that's exactly what is needed and, and the, the, the cornerstone that has to happen, the milestone that has to happen in order to enable any application, any practical application of uh, any of these uh, encryption. But, uh, yeah. um, so, and I, just echoing that, I think the Medco example is a great example of you going into a demonstration yep. with, a, with a use case that people can really understand from the medical side and that you can execute uh, in a secure way. It kind of does definitely does work, and for me, both secure multi-party computation and homomorphic encryption gives us like two new cards to play um, uh, in how we solve some of these problems. When people say, "I will not let this data go outside," we can then ask this question: If it was in an encrypted form, mm. would you would that change your mind? If the answer is still no, then certain types of homomorphic encryption is out. But other, mm. but if the answer is, well, I might consider it. Yep. Yeah. And 
Juan and I were also talking about the fact that some of our current practice in, in the biomedical research world, I think, would be more secure if we adopted some of these techniques. So we do tend to, in security words, send an awful lot of things in plain text where we legally agree that we're not going to do anything bad. Yeah. And I, don't, I see there's no reason why we shouldn't consider tightening some of that up because then we'll, we'll have more of a security in depth approach on this. So that's a slightly different thing where we're actually comfortable with the, the current solution, but if we're honest and we look at that current solution, it does have a lot of, what is the word, attack surface or something like that. You, you know, there's lots of threats. Lots of threats, or lo and, and actually I'm, I'm more worried about um, a carelessness as much as I am bad, bad actors in this scheme. And by having more security in depth, one one reduces the probability of that happening. Yeah. Helen? So thank you, Juan, for the really comprehensive um, presentation. So maybe I'm asking Cecile's question in a slightly different way. But what do you think are the biggest barriers to uptake for homomorphic encryption by the genomics community? The, the biggest you know? barriers to uptake. Uh, so, 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 if it, so you have a package and you uh -huh. have a prototype, um, so is there a reason that I can't take it today and use it? Mm -hmm. Do you, does it need to mature? Are there other reasons that prevent it from being, you know, mainstream in the next year? What is going to stop that? Yeah, of course. Uh, when we talk about uh, cryptography, we always need to give some times for any cryptographic technique to be exposed to the community and really used. For the case of um, RSA, it took almost 30 years to, for, for people to, to really get uh, comfortable uh, using RSA. And uh, RSA will be broken by quantum computers uh, as soon as they appear. Uh, the same happens for, for this kind of uh, new cryptographic techniques like uh, lattice-based cryptography. Uh, they are starting to be exposed uh, to the community and starting to be used in, in real use cases. Uh, the fact that, the, that there's uh, a big um, industry um, stakeholders backing all these uh, products and all these uh, cryptographic systems gives you an idea of uh, what's the power and what's the potentiality uh, of all these approaches. Because when uh, companies, when industrial players start implementing and marketing solutions and they become market ready, this means that they're ready for prime time, so they can already be used. Uh, for the case of um, what the, the specific case of uh, what we are developing and uh, the, this Metco prototype and uh, any other uh, uh, security prototype that we are producing, everything is open source. So everything is open to the scrutiny of um, anybody, both from the security community and from the, the, the environment community, the, the medical community. Uh, it can be used actually for, for Metco in this uh, link here, you can find uh, all the software, all the packages, uh, all the documentation, uh, also test data to, to test it, deploy it in your, in your computer, everything. So again, we are open to feedback. So the more feedback we get from the, the, uh, the medical community, the better we can do uh, and the better the, the security community can do. Uh, I think we are not very far away from uh, adoption uh, from these technologies. And we are in the right window of time. So as, as Ewan said, uh, this is a, a very big opportunity and we, are, we have to serve the wave and we have to try to apply these technologies and, and test them in real cases now that we are ready to, to do so. Thank you. I think we should, um, we should end it here because we're running out of time. So thank you for, for all the people who who came here physically, and thank you for all the people who came here virtually, and in particular, thank you for Juan for coming all the way from Switzerland. So thank, thank you, Juan. Very much.